The Hidden Grove series, book one, Perlo. Chapter one. For the tenth time that day, I shook the image of those empty green eyes from my mind. I stared instead at the blazing red of the December poinciana trees that lined the edge of the bushland. A backdrop of eucalyptus trees intensified the display of blossom. Art journal tucked under my arm, I made my way from the car park and past the Mianjin Town Museum towards the twin buildings of the art gallery. The dinosaur skeletons cluttered the entrance hall of the museum to my left. The sharp teeth and long boned wings of the pterodactyls reminded me of the time I'd visited as a child, unafraid of the large creatures hanging above, safe as I swung between my parents' arms. But that was a long time ago. The sweltering heat was tempered only by the shadow of the towering concrete mass before me. It was a long journey to take each day, but far better than staying in that house that felt too large and yet suffocating all at the same time. The hissing gallery air conditioning welcomed me home once more. Here was the one place my mind could wander far enough to forget the gaping hole in my heart. The walls stretched out before me, wide and glaring, accentuating the paintings that dotted the surface. Though the gallery was the same as yesterday, I eagerly crept closer, my footsteps echoing on the tiled floors past the matching white leather lounge. There, on the arm of the couch, were smudged charcoal fingerprints. I smiled. Clearly I was not the only one who found inspiration and solace here. A lone security guard eyed me from the corner of the room, Ignoring his watchful eye, I stepped up to the painting before me. I'd gazed upon it more times than I could count, but always found something new to captivate me. From the way the woman's eyes seemed to follow mine, to the posture with which she held herself, to the layers of intricate shades of pink across her lips, to the sweeping, mysterious mountains in the background. The painting called me back time and again. It was those mysterious mountains that held me today. I could tell they were not Australian mountains, from the perfectly round stones covered in moss in the foreground to the pointing sandstone cliff jutting out behind at odd angles. They resembled an ancient highlander's perlo. My heart constricted and my hand reached out, wanting to touch the soft, moist moss, to smell its nutrient-rich dirt, to hear the sounds of foreign bird calls. How I wished to travel to such faraway places, see such remarkable sights, to paint their enchanting terrains, and to get far away from here. The security guard cleared his throat and I withdrew my hand. I took out my art journal, flipped to an empty page, past portraits of strangers and replicas of countryside paintings, and set to work. The ancient Highlander's Perlo was my starting point and I mimicked the odd angles of the mountains. As I began to fill in the detail, I added my own touches. The motion of wind, the glisten of dewfall, the vibrant red of the trees changing season. If only I had graduated from school already. If only I had saved enough money. I could travel and see places with my own eyes instead of making a fantasy world to explore with my mind on the page. Sure, I was about to start my final year at Mianjin Arts Academy, but I've been waiting and saving up for years now. The end of grade 12 couldn't come fast enough. I peeped back to the corner of the room where the security guard had now turned his back. My hand slipped silently into my pocket and brought back a small square of chocolate to suck on. Its sweet, smooth surface slowly disintegrated in my mouth. It was the momentary comfort that I needed for my mind had started to slip back to those eyes that haunted me from the mortuary gurney. The gallery began to fill with echoing footsteps and hushed tones. People were crowding around me, poking their nosy beaks into what I was drawing, standing just a little bit too close, wanting the painting of the woman all to themselves. But now, my back was aching from hunching over my art journal, so I gave up my place thinking of the white leather lounge in the centre of the room. I turned to make my way through the crowd when I ran into a wall. No, not a wall. A person. 
My journal flew from my hands as we crashed to the ground, my pencil clattering against the tiles. I flushed red as people stared and old women tutted at how we'd disturb the peace. I picked up my pencil and reached for my art journal, spread open on an enchanting charcoal mountain range, and realised it was not mine. The mountain range had an ethereal quality to it that I couldn't quite put my finger on. I looked up to find the journal's artist thumbing his way through my own journal. His shaggy brown hair hung down, shielding his face. He raked it back with his fingers and looked at me, unabashed. He smelled of cinnamon. You are very talented, he said. His eyes glistened like the dewy moss of my sketches as he reached out to pull me to my feet. My bony hands felt small in his large, rough ones. He looked at my paint-spattered hands. You prefer acrylic, then? he asked. I nodded. I'd stopped scrubbing at the dried paint on my skin, knowing that the next day would bring new splotches. He didn't see my response. Instead, his gaze lingered on my right hand. My weak hand. I whipped it away quickly and shoved it into my pocket. It was none of his business. I brushed my wild auburn hair out of my face in embarrassment and we exchanged journals. My heart was beating too fast. I began to walk away. I am William of Perlo. <laughs> of Perlo? I asked. Was he kidding? Yes, William of Perlo, he repeated. I smiled. Evelyn O'Shea, I said. He held out his hand to shake but I just stared at it pointedly until he drew it back apologetically. I hope I did not hurt you. I couldn't tell if he meant our collision or his blatant staring at my weak hand. It was bad enough that I had to see the mangled ripple across my palm every day, let alone relearn how to paint using my other hand. Like everyone at school, he'd made it far worse by staring. But now he looked at me with such genuine concern. His shining eyes drew me in, my stomach knotted with guilt for turning down his handshake. It wasn't his fault my hand was curious to look at, and how was he to know that it was still mostly functional? I'd only lost fine motor skills in the accident. I shook my head. The crowd had continued on around us as though nothing had happened. I reached into my other pocket and drew out the bag of chocolate squares. Want one? He took a square and held it up to the light. His eyes glinted. <laughs> My stomach turned over. I motioned for him to put it in his mouth. Mmm, food is good. I teased him, rubbing my stomach and mimicking the voice of a Neanderthal. His eyes lighted up as he smiled. A very accurate impression, he said. It was a strange thing to say, and a strange way to say it. He placed the chocolate in his mouth and started to chew it. You're doing it wrong. You're meant to suck on it. I was hopeless at flirting. That was Tiffany's domain. He took my advice and his cheeks creased into dimples. His smile broadened as though he'd never tasted anything like it before. Such a strange man. And a man he was. Bristles had formed across his chin. He had to be older than 18, but probably not older than 25. I've never seen you around here before. I said. I could say the same for you. <laughs> I'm here, like, every day. No. I folded my arms in defiance, tucking my weak hand underneath, out of sight. What do you mean, no? I said. I think I would remember a face like yours. Despite myself, I felt my face flush red again. Cursed Irish skin. I had to change the subject or get out of there fast. Where do you get your ideas from? I asked, nodding at his journal. The magical mountainscape was like nothing I'd ever seen before. He flipped his journal open again. Oh, this. I realise now why it seemed so ethereal. The black charcoal strokes made the waterfall appear to be running backwards. I would never have thought of using such a technique. He scratched at the stubble across his chin. It came to me, one night in a dream, he said. I envied him, not for his vivid nighttime imagination, but for the fact that he had dreams at night rather than nightmares. 
The empty eyes gazing up at me from the mortuary gurney flashed through my mind once more. It was enough that I had to relive it night after night, let alone during waking hours too. Did I say something to upset you? I shook my head, shaking the thoughts away. I've traveled far and wide and seen many great terrible things, he said. You don't sound like a local. My tongue is influenced by the many people I have met. I envied him even more now, how I ached to travel. Is that Shakespeare? I asked. He laughed, shaking his head. <laughs> English was never my strong subject, I said. I take it art is where you thrive. I nodded. It is one of my great loves also, he said. I was running out of things to say. Uh, well, it was nice to meet you. Goodbye. Again, I made to walk away. May I see you again, Evelyn O'Shea? My stomach constricted. I slowly turned back to face him. But I don't know you. You could come to know me in time. But my father... Here, at the gallery, the same time tomorrow. Why would a man like him want to spend time with a girl like me? I watched his striking green eyes a moment longer. They were so captivating. He was so captivating. I nodded once. His beaming smile broadened and he rubbed his hands together. Wonderful. Just wait until I tell Tiffany. Clothes littered my bedroom floor while Tiffany watched on video chat. The floorboards under the carpet creaked as I looked at myself from different angles in the cheval mirror. Tiffany's girlish voice filled the room. <laughs> Don't wear that. It makes your boobs look even smaller than they are. Can I borrow your boobs for the day then? I said. Maybe her tan skin too while I was at it. <sighs> I ripped off the silk camisole and flopped on my bed. Why was I so nervous? It wasn't even a real date. I still can't believe you're doing this. Your dad is going to kill you when he finds out. He won't find out, I said. He has to eventually. William is a total gentleman. If and when my father does find out, he realizes how much he likes him and forget that I went out alone with a complete stranger. Saying it aloud like that sent a flurry of doubt across my mind. Was this a bad idea? You only met him yesterday, and you spoke for like two seconds. He's not your boyfriend yet. How do you know what he's really like? Yeah, well, he may not even show. My stomach constricted. I couldn't figure out what would be worse. If he showed, or if he didn't. I really wish you'd let me come round to do your makeup. Just, you know, hide some of your freckles. <laughs> that would require hiding my entire face arms, and a third of my legs, Tiffany. We sighed simultaneously. She sounded tired of the conversation. There was a long silence, during which I clenched my fists in frustration. I'd done the pre-date drama plenty of times for her. After he kisses you, I expect full details. I've never kissed a guy with facial hair before. <laughs> I've never even kissed a guy before. How am I supposed to compare? And he's not going to kiss me. We only just met. Yeah, but he's older. Yeah, but we only just met. If he did kiss me, would I want him to? I imagined his big, soft lips crushing against mine. <sighs> My heart skipped a beat. You're not helping, Tiffany. You've been on a ton of dates. What should I wear? Oh, so it's a date now, is it? Tiffany! Okay, okay. The summer dress. It's very girl next door. I dragged myself out of bed and into the dress. And your hair, up off your shoulders. Guys like necks. I put my art journal into my backpack. What are you doing? Um, packing my bag? What are you bringing that for? It's a date! <laughs> We're hanging out at the gallery. He has a journal too. It's how we met, remember? Tiffany sighed and rolled her eyes. I knew she thought I was a big fat nerd. Sometimes I wondered if she wanted to be friends with me anymore. 
From a rickety seesaw in kindergarten to Mianjin Arts Academy, we'd been inseparable. Even though we were so different from one another now, we knew things about each other that no one else did. Like how I didn't shed a tear the day of the funeral. Like how her father was making a new family without her and her mum. It was hard to turn your back on so much history, but I was starting to think she was toying with the idea. How was pancakes with your dad this morning? I asked. Oh, he cancelled again. I nodded. I didn't know what else to say. I had the opposite problem to her. My father was too involved. Well, I'd better get going, I said. I spoke my hair up into a ponytail and grabbed my bag and car keys. Don't do anything I wouldn't do, Tiffany said. <laughs> That's not the greatest advice. She cackled like a kookaburra. I couldn't help but smile. She had the most ridiculous laugh I'd ever heard. I know, I know. Message me if he turns out to be a creep and you need an excuse to leave. <laughs> Thanks, Tiff. I made my way downstairs as quietly as I could, but sure enough, there was my father waiting in the living room that led off the entrance hall. His presence filled the space between the walls, his graying eyebrows crinkled in austerity. You're not going to the art gallery again, are you? My body tensed up. I wished he wouldn't pounce on me with that stern voice every time I came home and went from the house. So what if I am? You've been there every day since this Christmas holiday started. I want to be an artist. I'd have thought it was good that I was spending my time there. He scrutinized me, eyes narrowed. I sighed. I'm going to Tiffany's. Will there be boys there? William's glistening eyes flashed across my mind. No. I consciously kept my hands still and in plain sight. My face relaxed, my eyes steadily focused on him, but not too focused. It was a trick I'd learned from being a police officer's daughter. He was good at catching liars, so I had to avoid the physical signs of lying. He'd spoken of his work often enough over the years that I'd picked up on the habits to avoid. Don't touch your face. Stay calm. Never look to the right. He pursed his lips. Okay, but be back before curfew. Curfew was 10pm, but mercifully, he usually had night duty. He wasn't there to know whether I made it home in time or not. I left before he changed his mind. I stood before the woman of the ancient Highlanders Perlo. She hadn't changed since the previous day. I tried to distract myself with the structure of her face, the high cheekbones, the square forehead, her pointed nose. William was late. What if he didn't come? The sweet scent of blossom mixed with cinnamon hit me. Hello, Evelyn. I wheeled around and there he was with those green eyes, holding a single musk-coloured peony. His checkered button-up was immaculately pressed. His hair was combed back, eyes glistening just as I remembered. I couldn't help but smile. A beautiful flower for a beautiful lady. The blood of the Irish rushed through my cheeks again. You can't say that, I said. I glanced uncomfortably around the empty gallery. The snooty security guard eyed us from his corner. Why not? Because you're not my boyfriend. Because beauty is only skin deep, I said. He chuckled and shook his head. Where did you get it from? I asked. My garden. Just like these. He pulled back the towel covering the wicker basket by his side and revealed a generous pile of bright red strawberries. I glanced back at the security guard who continued to watch us carefully. There's a soft grassy patch at the edge of the bushland, he said. He turned and started walking away. I hurried to follow as he led me towards the glass door of the art gallery, holding it open for me. My heart pounded against my chest. Was this really a good idea? I really wanted to trust him. The heat of the sun hit me. So, do you have a garden or do you like to garden? I asked. I live on a farm, so both, he said. We cut through the stone path that went between the art gallery and the bushland. We continued all the way to the point where the path curved around and traveled deep into the bushes. There on the bend of the path, we settled beneath a flaming red poinciana on the grass. An occasional hot breeze blew as a mum jogged past with a pram. William picked a strawberry from his basket and held it to my lips, offering. The sweet aroma filled my nostrils. My stomach nodded as I took a bite. 
but my teeth couldn't cut through the whole way. After an agonizing moment of my mouth being way too close to his hand, the strawberry seven in half and juices dripped down my face. He flicked his mousy brown hair back and smiled. Here, let me get that. He wiped the juices away with his handkerchief, leaving a sticky feeling. I smelt like strawberry, and my skin burned like the flaming red blossoms of the poinciana above. You are cute when you're embarrassed, he said, pulling his spice shaker from his basket and sprinkling some cinnamon straight on the strawberry. He bit down and gave a goofy grin as the juice dribbled from his mouth. What I meant before is I have lived and worked on a farm my whole life. What kind of farm? I asked. Oh, I do a little of everything. I keep animals, but I also have crops and an orchard. My specialty is spices, cultivated to be the best in the universe. <laughs> You're very modest, I teased. The spices speak for themselves, he said. He sprinkled his spice shaker over another strawberry and offered it to me. What about you, Evelyn? You are a famous artist, are you not? I took the strawberry, the smell of cinnamon catching in my nose. It tasted good. Oh no, I laughed. I'm still studying. One day, maybe. I want to travel and paint and see where that takes me. He nodded knowingly and pulled out his art journal from the wicker basket. I took some time away from the farm a couple of years ago to travel. He flipped open the art journal to the first spread. It was sparse and dry and the haze of a mirage hovered just above the surface of the charcoal land. This was the first desert I ever saw with my own eyes. Despite the barren emptiness of the scene, it held a certain living quality, as if life were hiding just below the surface. He turned the page. This was the first man-eating plant I ever saw. It actually was not a pleasant thing to draw, I can assure you. They are putrid smelling things. Ah, oh, I thought they actually didn't exist. Oh, but they do. The cry of a man stuck inside is the most horrible sound you'll ever hear. It still haunts me sometimes. You saw a man being eaten alive by a plant? No, I only heard his cries. It was too late by the time I found him. I didn't know whether to believe him or not. He turned the page. And this was the first and last time I will ever go cave diving. Amid the drawing of murky seawater, with sparkling treasures and obscure creatures with tentacles, fins and eyes, an eerie yet alluring sight. I couldn't look away until he snapped the journal shut before my eyes. Didn't your family miss you while you were off exploring? I asked. He scratched his chin and thought for a moment, as though he wasn't ready to talk about it. I do not have any family. Oh. I paused. What do you mean? My parents abandoned me as a child and I have no other living relatives. None that I know of anyway. Oh, I'm really sorry. It's okay, I'm used to it. I couldn't imagine having no family. Even a father like mine was better than no one at all. It will not always be this way. I will start a family of my own one day. You want children? Of course. I hope you realize that this made him ten times more attractive. I nodded as though it was no big deal, though. It's just me and my father at home. My mum. My throat caught on the words. I never said them aloud before. My mum passed away earlier this year. In February. He stopped picking at the strawberry seeds in his teeth and looked at me with steady eyes. That is far worse than never knowing your parents. To have one ripped away? I'm so sorry. I shrugged my shoulders. Do not brush it off. She was your mother. <laughs> she is my mother. His forehead creased at my correction. I always wanted a father, he continued. You are lucky to still have him. I looked down and picked at the dried paint that flecked my hands. Sometimes... Sometimes I wish that it had been him that died instead of her. I'd never said that aloud before either. I glanced up. His eyes shone with a thin film of liquid. He placed his hand on my strong one and squeezed. 
His touch sent goosebumps across my skin. <sighs> I'm a terrible person, I said. No, no. She obviously meant a lot to you. Who could blame you for thinking such a thing? But my father, well, he tries. It's just, it's just that I can't stand him sometimes. He's so suffocating. What do you mean? He wants to know where I am all the time. Like, can't I just live my life already? William nodded. That is the best part about my farm. There is no one there to tell me what to do or how to live. Oh, sounds like a dream. He picked up another strawberry and offered it. The juice dribbled down my chin again. Only if you do not easily become lonely, he said. Is that why you visit the art gallery? He smiled, his eyes lighting up. Exactly. He had such gorgeous eyes. They were the kind of eyes that could persuade me to do anything. Deep and sparkling and mysterious. I wanted to stare into them all day, like a painting at the gallery. He must have read my mind, for he flipped his art journal open again. Hold that pose, he said. He pulled a piece of calico from his pocket, unwrapped a stick of charcoal and proceeded to sketch me. Your face, it catches the light so wonderfully from this angle. He traced his forefinger down the middle of my face, from my forehead, over my nose, across my lips and around my chin. His touch sent a new wave of goosebumps across my skin. Your silhouette is very elegant. I blushed and tried to steady my expression until it was done. My heart pounded. I wanted the moment to end, yet last forever. Now you may move. I let out a breath and glanced at his work. He'd made me more beautiful than I thought I could be, glazing over my abundance of freckles and my untamable hair. Now it's my turn, I said. I took out my art journal. How shall I sit? He asked. From his weathered hands to his broad shoulders, strong neck, thick eyebrows and shaggy brown hair, he looked every part a farmer. But his eyes told another story that I could not place. They captivated me. It was his eyes only that I wanted to draw, to unravel the mysteries that hid behind them. Relax, and just look at me. With pleasure, he said. I ignored the constricting feeling in my stomach at his compliment and sketched his glistening eyes. What were hidden behind those eyes? What wonderful secrets were waiting to be found? How I ached to know him and his secrets. I turned my journal to face him, his almond eyes like a pair of opulent emeralds filling the page. He smiled. Evelyn, he said, may I see you again? My stomach constricted a second time in nervous excitement. All I wanted was to nod my head with a vigorous yes. But what about my father? What about waiting until I finished school? It was his one rule, other than curfew. No boyfriends until I'd finished my studies. But that was still a whole year of school ahead. I couldn't possibly wait that long or make William wait. He was so perfect. My father would love him once he got over his anger. Once he could see that for the first time since mum had died, I actually felt happy. Okay, I said. What my father didn't know couldn't hurt him. We continued to see each other for the rest of the Christmas holidays. William didn't have a phone, but it didn't matter. We shared a love of art, our favorite spot on the grass, and one another's company at the same time every day. It was the most perfect summer. By the end of it, joy had crept into my life and I found I could laugh again. I smiled constantly in William's presence, but when I returned home at night, the joy always dissipated as my father met me at the door, ready to barrage me with questions about where I'd been, with whom and why. Of course, I never told him about William, repeating the same lie day after day. I was at the art gallery. I was alone, studying the paintings. I want to be an artist. He never seemed entirely satisfied with my answers.